Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. Performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 176 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck, and if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off. I want to just say hi to the Springfield University crew. They actually just signed up as a group. We got uh, about 12 or 13 of them uh, going on there. So check that out at strengthcoach.com. I'm your host, Anthony Rana, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. If you want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about a couple of forum topics, including the reverse jump drill, is CrossFit good for business, and raising an athlete's threshold. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Aaron McGurr from Perform Better joins us to talk about the big holiday sale and the one day learn by doing workshop coming up in New Jersey. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Crosgrove is on to talk about time management. For the Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach segment, I have Pat Davidson on. He's the Director of Training Methodology and Continuing Education at Peak Performance in New York City. He's on to discuss, among other things, GPP, volume, exercise selection, and movement variability, body comp for athletes, and so much more. Great discussion coming up with Coach Davidson in a little while. On the Art of Coaching with Exos, Joel Sanders is on to talk about setting up for success in the core lifts. And for the Functional Movement System segment, Frank Dolan continues his series on a review of the basics of the seven screens of the FMS. Today he's on to talk about the hurdle step. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how are you doing? I am doing great, Anthony. How are you? All right, I'm doing great. Doing great. Um, lot of a uh, lot of lot of forum activity. Been been really good lately. So, um, I, I here's I think this is an interesting one, and I think at first it's one of those posts where we start to say, "Oh, come on, why would we do that?" But at the same time, I think there's some some maybe some value to just discussing it. Obviously, um, it's the reverse jump drill, and so. I recently added a reverse jump drill to a routine and was questioned about the risk-reward factor to this drill. We're always jumping forward, so I think jumping backward would be a worthwhile drill to promoting power generation in a direction not often focused on. I don't see much risk in this movement as long as the jumper is landing with bent knees. Thoughts? Uh, Before I ask you uh, to expand on my my thoughts on this, Coach, tell us what, what you think of this. Well, one, as you said, I love when people post this stuff because it does prompt really good discussions. And it was interesting. I think it was Nate Backhall that said um, intent. Just that was the only word they posted. And that was kind of the first thought that I got. Like, if you said, okay, um, you know, I'm putting it in for my defensive backs or, you know, I'm putting it in for my, like, backs Mm -hmm. in soccer – I might be like, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, now we've got a little why there. You know, I think I keep going back. I love that whole start with why idea. And yeah. and I think the simplistic why is, like with warm-up, we do everything. You think about, like, locomotion stuff. We do all our ladder drills forward, backward. We're trying to make people go in both directions. I think it is good and early. But then you get into that sort of risk-reward, like, okay, is this really worth it? And that's sort of where I would sit on that one. I'd look at that and go, um, I don't know. You know, I don't know if that's worth it. I think, and and then we'd go into like, okay, who are you doing it with? Who's the population? Are you talking about, are you at a fitness center? Are you dealing with kids? And, and so I think there's a lot of variables that go in there. My general, and I think that's what I said in the thread, my general feeling would be that the risk outweighs the reward. That if we're going to, you know, if we're analyzing it, and I love this idea because it's like, it's what a lot of business schools do. It's like, okay, put an idea up on the board. You know, we put it up on the whiteboard and then we analyze it. And I think that's what the form is really good for is kind of that virtual whiteboard idea. And that's why I've been throwing some stuff up there. You know, I threw that 
is CrossFit good for business up there? I threw some stuff out there to say, okay, let's talk about this and see. Because sometimes somebody gives you a very different why than what you had in your mind. And you yeah. think, and, and I'll talk, when we, I'm writing an article right now about a case for cool down. Anna Hartman just came out and did a really good in-service for us like a potentially game changing, like almost like a PRI level in service in terms of, wow, wow. she might've just sold me on the idea of cool down, which I've never been off. You've heard me say it probably a million times, yeah. whatever, you know, get out of here, go home. And, and, but she presented a very different why in, in not to change the subject, but you know what I mean? So, so I guess that's the big thing that I'd look at. They start with why idea. Why are you jumping backwards? Are you just mm-hmm. jumping backwards? Like, because he's interaction. I think it would be a good idea. We do a lot of stuff forward. I'm like, eh, I don't know if that's good enough. Why for me? Because one, it doesn't happen very often. Power generation backwards, probably very limited number of specific positions in sport. Like I said, as I said, defensive back in football, maybe some of your midfielders and backs in soccer might be required to be able to backpedal rapidly. Um, so I guess I, I, I could I could probably go the whole whatever 20 minutes about this. So I'll, I'll stop and let you start talk. <laughs> well, I was thinking it kind of brought to mind this idea about, um, for example, the, this where the research has gone in terms of um, – uh, doing something like if you're a righty pitcher to throw lefty. So for and Titleist has done a lot of research and found that um, all the best players in the world did something lefty and they're righty golfers. So they played hockey or they did something or they were, were lefties. They just played righty, and you know it's this idea of kind of maybe trying to be a, 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 being more symmetrical, right? So. That's where I was going with, I wonder if there's some value to that from that perspective um, along those lines. You know what I mean? Where, you know, it's the same research that said, uh, you know, if you break your right arm and you do work with your left hand, right? And so Vern Gambetta wrote that, was talking about that in an article that he had written a, a while back, just talking about, you know, getting pitchers to throw lefty if they're a righty pitcher. So doing that opposite uh, uh, movement. Just uh, w- what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and that's why I said I think, and that my problem is in that sort of risk reward area because I think in some ways we do that all the time in the sense that we don't really train people to their handedness. Whether it's you know we do med balls, we do med balls both sides. You know we lift, we lift both sides. You know we don't just we don't just deal with the specific pattern that we that we would be doing. But I think you know we get into that that debate, you know, I've had the same, you know, it's sort of, you don't practice crashing your car, even though you know you might do it sometime. You know what I mean? I think that's where you've got to be analyzing risk versus reward and looking at that and saying, okay, does this really, is there enough value here for me to take the risk of somebody landing in reverse? Because that except with kids, you know, kids would probably find it fun. And kids are probably less competitive and they wouldn't be trying to jump as far as they could. And they just have fun. He said, Hey, we're going to go through the ladder, you know, double leg hops, you know, skipping a box backwards. They'd bang them out. They'd have a great time, you know, and then, but then someone else is going to say, well, how about backwards box jumps? You know, how about if we're only going to a low box, you know, well, what if we tried to get onto the 24 inch box? And so I guess you always have that like slippery slope gray area kind of thing. So, I guess that's what you got to look at as you go through this thought process is this idea of, all right, at what point does a good idea become a bad idea? So yeah, absolutely. My, my two cents. Um, well, you mentioned the other thread I was gonna, I was going to bring up is CrossFit good for business? And I think I think a lot of people at first glance might be like, oh, there's Mike. He's going to try and bash CrossFit again. It was actually a legitimate question uh, that you were asking, and I, I think it was a good one because for me, I think there's absolutely no question. I think CrossFit has. I mean, when the fact that it, it's almost like saying, oh, I'm going to go Xerox something. It's not a you're not Xeroxing. You're copying it. People use right. the word CrossFit to say, "Oh, I'm going, I'm going CrossFit. To go, I'm going to go CrossFit." Yeah. Well, are you? You're a member at CrossFit? Oh no, no. I mean, I'm going to uh, do my workout. 
you know, my workout of the right. day or whatever. Um, so yeah. I, I think, you know, and then you have, like you said, with the um, CrossFit Games, you have Reebok stores in malls that are basically, you know, promoting uh, this stuff, I, I, you know, as, as well. Um uh, sell, you know, you can see equipment's more accessible in, in even in a mall. You can, be, you can get some kettlebells or some med balls. So from my perspective, I think no doubt. I think uh, other people were also saying, well, I've, uh, you know, uh, maybe that you were trying to say, is it good because people get hurt there? Because um, not everybody gets hurt there. <laughs> so, but, right. um, but like what you said as well, just with the, the fact that for whatever reason, your adult population is thriving right now. And, and there has to be, uh, uh, you know, we, we do have to give, uh, I think, in my opinion, CrossFit some credit for, for that exposure. Yeah, I go back to the same, you know, Dan John talking about, in much the same way when people talk about, well, is, how long will CrossFit be around? And Dan brought up the Nautilus analogy. Well, if you look at Nautilus, you know, Nautilus was kind of here today, gone tomorrow. You know, one day you just woke up and all the Nautilus centers were gone. And so I think, you know, when you're thinking about CrossFit, you probably have that same phenomenon. Like, what did Nautilus do for just the health club industry, for machine training, for all these other companies that went on to make single station machinery? I mean, it was huge. What, you know, what happened as a result of this big Nautilus thing? And it was the same idea, very cultish, got to do it this way, but the general effect of that when viewed over time, I think when we view, and I always kind of write about I've in my new talk that I'm doing, you know, I kind of look at things in terms of the periods, you know, the, the bodybuilding period was followed by the powerlifting period, which was followed by the Olympic lifting period, which was followed by the performance enhancement period. And, you know, we, this may end up being like the, the CrossFit or, circuit training, you know, break your ass, kill yourself, period. <laughs> and you might look at that and think, hey, that was from from the standpoint of being the owner of a fitness facility, which is what you are, what I am, I have to look at that and say, hey, that might very well have been a good thing. That might have been a very positive trend, in spite of the fact that, that I'm not a fan, in spite of the fact that, you know, I may have... Um, kind of gotten some some negative uh, whatever publicity um, from that phenomenon you I have to look at our adult business and think shit why is our adult business up so drastically and I do believe that's why and it's funny because there was some it was interesting how some people interpreted that thread and um, you know when we looked at that uh you know, some people looked at that thread and said, hey, you know, I don't have any uh, former CrossFitters coming in. I was kind of like, no, nah, I don't think that's what I was thinking. What I was thinking more is about the people who are seeing all these other people doing all this kind of multi-joint exercise kind of stuff and um, and realizing that, um, you know, that, hey, there's a, lot, a whole lot of, there's a lot of more world out there than like, being a hamster walking on the habit trail, you know, in the treadmill in the cow club. And it's been good. So I'm, I'm not going to complain. Yeah. And there's always the only, good thing, the only good thing I'll ever say about CrossFit. <laughs> there's always that residual effect. Absolutely. Um, coach, Let's finish up with this question. It was on the forum. He had asked for a little bit more elaboration, so I'll let you do it here. Um, it was talking about um, the uh, thoughts on optimal rest for raising an athlete's threshold. He'll lay out the scene. Soccer, in this case, and interval training. Say, for example, I'm doing position-specific 25- and 30-yard sp splits, 300-yard shuttle runs with heart rate monitors, partial recovery or full recovery, question mark. Anyone have any thoughts on the optimal recovery to raise threshold? Give them more rest where they recover to 130 and adjust the time as the sets go on, or give them partial recovery where it's more along the lines of 150 to 160 or maybe even higher. Um, you wrote, give them more rest where they recover to 130, which you've talked about extensively over the years on this podcast. You've been doing this for a long time and adjust the time as the sets go on. He wanted you to elaborate just uh, 
Can you just do that here? Yeah, yeah, I need to go back on the site too and do it. But yeah, I, I think otherwise, and I don't know, I can't come up with sort of a better word than, I, you know, I think we use the term acidic, like lactic acid and, you know, whatever it is, I think when you get up into that constant 150, 160 incomplete recovery, I don't think that's going to help you raise your threshold because you don't have that kind of up and down. It's really not, even though you're, it looks like you're doing interval training. When your heart is looking at it, it's not interval training. It's pretty much steady state training because you're not getting that, that up down effect. And I think what you want to train, like in my mind, you want to train recovery and you can't train recovery without recovering. I just don't see how that can happen. So when you look at that and maybe you may have to play with the numbers a little bit, it might be, 110 for some people, it might be 130 for other people in some ways based on their fitness level, based on how they adapt to the particular situation. But I think somebody's going to start to feel pretty crappy if they're staying in that 150, 160 range, supposedly doing interval work. So if you're looking at them and saying, okay, we're going to rest a minute, and you look and you think they're still at 150, their heart rate hasn't come down, that's not a very good sign. You know, when you have, if you read any of the stuff like, you know, Dave Penny or Patrick or any of those guys. I mean, I think everybody's looking at this idea that, that the recovery period should have some recovery. And the only thing we've got to monitor that by is heart rate. The problem with it, and I think I said to you, is one of those things that we used to do at BU. It's a bizarre scene to watch as people appear to be randomly going at all kinds of crazy times. You know, some people are going up and back and resting for 15 seconds and then going again, and other people are resting for 45 and someone else is resting for a minute. But I think, to me, that's the best way to do it. And if you look, I got a link to the article. I don't think I did. I wrote that old interval training hit or miss, and I think we reposted it not so long ago. Um, but I talked specifically about that idea. You know, you can do one of two things. One thing is obviously time-based interval training. The other is heart rate-based interval training. I'm a huge fan of heart rate-based interval training because I think in a world where we, you know, where we don't, at least me, where I don't espouse individualization a lot, that really allows us to individualize mm -hmm. because you can literally say, nope, you're not ready to go yet. You need to rest longer. Yeah, it's good stuff. And again, we've, we have talked about that um, on the podcast for a while. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, and I was just talking to one of our hockey girls about it today, they were asking, you know, because they all get different heart rate responses. And, you know, I have a, one of the girls, like, I have a really low resting heart rate, but it goes really high. You know, my resting heart rate's 50. You know, I go up to 190. Is that bad? I'm like, no, it's not bad. So if you want to measure, if you want some sort of measuring stick of how, what kind of shape you're in, so just look at your one-minute recovery. Your one-minute recovery will tell you a lot about your current state of fitness. So if you do something hard and you get up into that high into that 90 percent range then look and see what happens at the end of a minute if you're in the 30 to 40 beat range you're pretty fit if you're under 30 you're probably not too fit if you're in the 20s you're really unfit and that's pretty simple the only thing that skews it i've found that when you do true max effort like let's say for me if i do five miles on the assault bike which is like a you know, an 18 minute ride, give mm -hmm. or take 18, 19. And I go all out at the end. My recovery will probably be high twenties, you know, 28 beats a minute. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I do something a little bit easier, I'll probably go to 32. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so your effort can skew that a little bit, but it's not going to skew it a lot. Okay. All right. All right, coach. Good stuff. We'll let you go and we will talk to you next week. <laughs> All right, Ant, it's always a pleasure. All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better. I am here with Aaron McGurr. Aaron, who's been working so hard on the catalog, coming out very soon. Um, give us an update really quick on the catalog -y. Um, It's finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for anyone that has had the opportunity to speak with me since, you know, June until now. They've 
have probably wondered what is wrong with me and why I've been so stressed out. But um, it is a huge project and it's finished. And I know a lot of people obviously look through the catalog and we print about a million of them and they go out throughout the year. So I am so excited for people to get it. Um, just to kind of see the new products, see what's out there. They should be hitting homes in about a week. Okay, so cool. I'm really looking forward to people getting it and hopefully getting some positive feedback, but really, you know, hearing what people think about the new products. Nice. And we'll all start talking about some of those products because uh, right now uh, that's going to hit, hit like the date you're talking about. It's right around Thanksgiving time. Um, and so once that goes out, you guys will have some of those products on the site. So we'll wait till then to talk about some products. So good. Looking forward to that. Um, E, big holiday sale up to 40% off free shipping on orders over $49. Uh, give us a little bit more of a rundown on it. Well, like you said, our holiday sale just started. We have savings up to 40% plus free shipping on those select products. Um, for orders over $49. So we do get the question a lot of times is, oh, everything's 40% off from free shipping. Unfortunately, that answer is no. There are some stipulations. But what's pretty cool is that we do have some items that are on sale. So kettlebells, hex bars, jam balls, even our half rack and adjustable bench, those are on sale. We have some items that just qualify for free shipping. So um, FMS test kits, core boards, banana steps, cones, tiger tails, massage sticks, you know, all sorts of um, different products that you may need, miscellaneous stuff that qualifies for free shipping. And then we have, I know I always say double dipping, but we have items that qualify for both. So foam rollers, elite med balls, Eric's pads, everyone loves super bins and mini bins, so those are always good. Ultimate sandbags, ropes, soft toss, those our products that qualify for a discount as well as free shipping. So it's pretty cool. Uh, everything's noted on the website. I know I always mention that it's great to get some shopping done for some of our fitness friends. So now would be a good time to take advantage of this sale and maybe get some Christmas shopping out of the way. But um, we also have gift cards available. I know that's big around the holidays. So if you don't know what they're interested in, it's always good to get something like that as well. So definitely take a look at that. Um, it's scary that it already started because, yes, the holidays are here. Yeah. And I feel like Halloween just ended. But um, it is going to be going until December 31st. So you have a lot of time to take advantage of it. Right now we do have stock on a lot of products, which is good. We are full right now. So now's the time to take advantage and get some things going. Very cool. We got uh, one last note, the uh, the one day coming up. Uh, so people will hear this and uh, kind of get that last minute opportunity to uh, to go to Fairlawn, New Jersey. Uh, give us just yeah. a quick who's on, who's speaking there. Um, in New Jersey, we have Brandon Marcello doing a speed development talk. We have Charlie Weingroff doing picking a plan, choosing the best approach. Martin Rooney, uh, Abilities of the World's Greatest Coaches, and Alan Cosgrove, 10 Things I Wish I Knew. So kind of covering everything from program design, coaching, uh, speed development. So it should be good. I'm excited. We already have over 200 people signed up. So I know it's always crowded. We usually have a waiting list for New Jersey. Um, Obviously, people took advantage of the early bird special pretty quickly. I will be down there, so I'm excited to hear the talks for the first time of the year. Um, so hopefully I'll see a lot of people down there. All right. Very cool. Looking forward to that. So, E, thank you so much for coming on. Also looking forward to the getting the catalogs in the mail. So uh, thanks for coming on. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Hi. Joel Sanders here with The Art of Coaching with Exos. When it comes to some of the core lifts like bench, squat, and deadlift, one of the major components of solid technique occurs before our athletes even lift the bar. Set up for success is one of our mantras that we'll teach over and over again, especially with the big bang core lifts. Here are some of the keys to a consistent setup for the bench press. And a couple of the keys are for coaches and then a couple are for athletes. So the first two for coaches. Number one, make sure the bench is set up in the rack in the same spot every time. At Exos, we use Kaiser Power Racks, and on the Kaiser Power Racks, 
there's a slide or a track that runs down the center of the rack. You know, and it, it has different slots to connect the bench in. We always place the bench in the same slot every time we're setting up for bench press. The second thing that we want to make sure is that the correct bar is in the power rack. Make sure that we, got t- we want to make sure we have a Texas power bar as opposed to an Olympic weightlifting bar. That way they've got the same uh, knurling, the same feel, and then there's also uh, the same knurling rings or hand placements on the bar that will allow the athlete to get a consistent setup every time so they're not grabbing a different barbell. Now when the athlete gets the setup, here we kind of try to teach a uh, systemized approach so that every time that they go to bench, they don't even have to think about it. You know, it's like a, a hitter getting into the batter's box. They just have a routine. So the routine that we'll teach here is the first thing that we want them to do is place their eyes under the barbell. Now, this isn't where they're going to finally end up, but it is where, there's, where they'll start. So eyes are looking directly up at the bar. From here, we'll have them take their hands and put them on the power rack behind them. And we'll literally have them push their body away from the barbell. So now they're looking up at the ceiling and they're probably anywhere from 6 to 12 inches away from the barbell when it's uh, sitting in the catch pins or the horns. And this allows two things. The first thing is an athlete should never miss a lift because the bar contacts the catches or the horns. That's just a simple setup uh, that will help that to, to not occur. And then the second thing is pushing away from the the bar but if you keep your feet where they're at so as soon as they set up eyes under the bar if they keep their feet up underneath them and then press away from the barbell using the power rack it allows them to coil their body up kind of cobra-esque which allows them to have more leg drive in their bench press and then allows more kind of pounds per square inch if you will after they push away and they've kind of coiled their body up We'll then have them get a, a big chest. So shoulders are packed, which allows for you know healthy, stacked, strong shoulders that press into the bench. And then that big chest or that arc in your chest, uh, it allows us to shorten the bar path just a little bit, um, you know, which allows us, again, to push greater loads um, and up performance in the bench press. And then last but not least, one of the simplest things, uh, but probably one of the most important, is use a tight grip. So uh, uh, I've, I've learned a concept that I learned from Pavel Satsulin called irradiation is simply imagine crushing the bar. And when you crush the bar, or if you're sitting in your car or at your desk right now and you make a fist with your hand, uh, you're not a light fist but a tight one, You don't just uh, activate the muscles of your wrist flexors, but it goes all the way up your arm and it'll even get into the shoulder cuff and the lat. So this concept kind of turns on uh, the musculature that's going from the bar to your hands to your body. In the first place, if you're looking to implement this is, um, we'll teach it with simple planking now on a um, day-to-day basis. So if we're holding planks, you are creating irradiation through squeezing your fist, abs, glutes, uh, and getting a top, you know, top to bottom approach from muscle activation there. So to recap, the two keys for the coaches, make sure the bench and the bar placement are consistent every time. And then for our athletes, eyes under the bar, push away so you're coiled up tight, big chest, and then crush the bar. Set up for success. These are a few keys to keep a solid and consistent bench press for our athletes. On behalf of Exos Education, I'm Joel Sanders. To learn more, visit us at teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. Hi, everybody. It's Rachel Cosgrove with Results Fitness University, and this is the Strength Coach Podcast, the business of fitness segment. Time management. This is a huge topic, comes up a lot of our masterminds. We have coaching members who bring up, you know, how do I manage my time? How do I, you know, I'm working too much in the business, so I can't work on the business. Sound familiar to anybody? How do you structure your time? How do you get that so that, you know, you feel like you have that time to work on the business? And I think that this also goes along with 
you know, I, what I would say is, you know, because a lot of people ask Alan and I, how do you guys get it all done? You know, you run two companies, you uh, have magazine articles, you have books coming out. Honestly, we we don't get it all done. <laughs> we depend on our team entirely. Uh, you know, it's not, we can't do it all and nobody can. And so I think step one, um, what we've seen for our coaching members is as their business is growing, as they're getting closer to, it's usually right around uh, 60 members, they need to start hiring a team. 50 to 60 members, you get to a tipping point where you can't handle it all. And usually at that point, you are doing all the coaching, you are doing everything, you're wearing all of the hats and you feel like you have no time to work on the business um, because you're in the business and because you know it's really grown to a point where you can't manage it on your own. And so when you start to get closer to that 50 to 60 members, maybe you've had your gym open you know, a year or so and um, you know, you're coaching all the members, it's time to bring on a team. First team member is going to be an office manager to help you with the day-to-day operations. And then you need to add that coach. And uh, as you add that coach and you get them coaching people and you start getting uh, you know, more and more clients and you're getting up closer to 100 clients, really you're, you're, you need to start to every month cut back. Cut back your coaching hours. Cut back until you are – what we've seen is for as your gym is growing – You know, as the owner, you want to get down to where you're under 20 hours a week. Um, 20 hours a week is still a lot as an owner, especially as you're building your team. But that's, you know, basically as your membership's growing towards that 100 mark, instead of you increasing the number of coaching hours you're doing, it's time to start decreasing the number of coaching hours you're doing and start to spend that time managing your team, growing your team, really getting, you know, your coaches to where they're at a level where your clients are going to love working with them and want to work with them. And that way it's not dependent on you. And so really setting yourself up to project, you know, right now, if you're at that 50 to 60 client mark and you're doing all the coaching as you hire that first coach, starting to, you know, over time, cut back your hours and give them hours. And then you're going to eventually hire a second coach. And, you know, once you hit that hundred member mark, you really should have two coaches working for you. Um, You should be working no more than 20 to 25 coaching hours so that you have another 20 hours to spend working on your business. And when I say working on your business, the most important things you can do as far as time management as an owner of a company is training your team, spending time with your team. The more, the better you can get them, the the better your business is going to be and the better you're going to do. So um, if you spend that time really making sure you're meeting with them, you're overseeing what they're doing, you're giving them tools, you're doing role playing, you're doing everything you can to get your team and give, you know, just investing in them to get them as great as possible. That's going to be part of that. Um, The other thing that you will not give up or delegate is going to be your marketing. You do want to stay involved in your marketing. You should still be the face of your business. You should still be getting out, getting in front of people. And uh, that should still be a big chunk of your time that that you're using as you're cutting back on your coaching hours. So that just kind of gives you a plan of attack as you are growing your business. Um, Yes, as you get up to that 50 to 60 mark, you will feel like you're at a tipping point. You're doing a lot, coaching a lot of members. Start to plan out how you're going to phase yourself back and start to phase your new coaches in and spend that time growing your team, growing your business, and taking your business to that next level where it's not dependent on you. Uh, That's a really really exciting time as you get uh, build a sustainable company for the long term, getting it to where, um, you know, you don't have to be there, but you're there because you want to be there. And uh, you're really driving it as the visionary and the, the owner and taking on a new role in your company. So um, start to think about that as your business is growing. Stuff to think about. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Again, this is Rachel Cosgrove, Results Fitness University. Uh, Make sure you jump on our website, resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Jump on our email list. We send out emails every week, uh, lots of great stuff, tips and tools to really fine-tune your business and take it to that next level and change the way fitness is done. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great week. Hi, my name is Frank Dolan, and I'm here to present the Functional Movement Systems segment on the FMS basics. Uh, This is the second installment of the series on the fundamentals of each test. Today we're going to discuss the hurdle step. One of the things we'll do is make sure that everyone is doing the same thing for consistency and reliability in the test. So we'll review the verbal instructions, some tips for testing, the criteria for each test, and then some of the nuances that are often missed, common questions and mistakes that we see in workshops. To start out, the verbal instructions for the hurdle step, 
we want to make sure we're following these verbal instructions after we get comfortable screening the test and finding criteria. We want to try to make sure that we're migrating towards using the exact verbal instructions with each client. So when you take your practice tests, when you're doing your practice FMS after getting the certification, it's important to migrate towards these specific verbal instructions. So we're going to start with having the client let you know if there is any pain with the movement that they give you that indication. We want to make sure we let them know that up front. Then we'll instruct them to stand tall with the feet together and toes touching the test kit. So that's actually both sneakers touching together and the toes touching the kit. We'll then instruct them to grasp the dowel with both hands and place it behind their neck and across the shoulders, very similar to holding it like a squat bar. While maintaining an upright torso, they'll raise the right leg to step over the hurdle, making sure to raise the foot towards the shin and maintaining foot alignment with the knee, ankle, and hip. They will then touch the floor with the heel and return that foot back to the starting position while maintaining foot alignment with the ankle, knee, and hip. You would then ask them if they understand these instructions. You're going to need a dowel and a hurdle to perform this test. Some of the tips for testing here are that we ensure that the cord is aligned properly. So we take a measurement before we do the test of the tibial tuberosity. We'll have them stand next to the kit and get that measurement from the bottom of the floor to the tibial tuberosity and move both pieces of the string on the kit to make sure that it's aligned properly. We'll then tell the client to stand as tall as possible at the beginning of the test. We're going to be scoring the moving leg. So if the, move, the moving leg is the left side, we're going to put the left side score in the left side column on the scorecard. The client can perform the movement up to three times on each side if necessary. They get three for each. We'll watch for a stable torso. We're going to observe from the front and from the side, and we want to make sure the toes of the stance leg stay in contact with the hurdle during each and after each repetition. Okay, we'll move on to a few nuances and common mistakes. Again, we want to make sure we're scoring the moving leg. We do not want to use a mirror. We don't want to give them that extra cueing by having them see themselves in the mirror. We want all the tests done exactly the same. So if we're using a mirror for some people and not for others, we're not going to have that consistency and reliability. The toes need to be directly up against the board. I think that's one that we see a lot. It's said, but not often done. We want to move around the client, as mentioned earlier. We don't want to demo it. We don't want to show them what the movement looks like. We're just going to use those verbal instructions. If loss of balance is noted and they can't return their foot back to the original starting position, it's not a two. That's going to be considered a one because they lost their balance. Uh, we want to do the test with shoes on. It's going to significantly uh, change the outcome of the test if we're doing this barefoot. We want them to be using shoes that they would use in a training situation. Uh, they do get three reps on each side, as mentioned before. If they are going to take, if you are going to take notes as a coach, we want to make sure that you're not trying to figure out and play detective and and know what the exact problem is of, of why there is movement dysfunction going on. You just would make notes on what those movement dysfunctions are. So just be observational, not try to figure things out, because we want to look at the entire score, the entire FMS uh, raw scores, to decide where to go next. Uh, if they perform the movement perfect, but it still hurts, it is still a zero. Uh, if the back of the leg touches the cord when they step over, so they'll touch the heel on the opposite side of the hurdle, but the back of their leg or their pants touches the cord, that's okay. That doesn't mean that they get a one on that. It's only if the foot uh, touches the cord on the, way over, uh, on the way over or on the way back that it would be considered a one. Uh, the outside of the stick, if they go with their foot outside of the stick, they're technically not stepping over the cords. So that could not be considered a two or a three. That's going to be a one. Uh, also, ch take a check. Sometimes people don't look enough at the stick. Uh, if the stick is being tilted or if someone's pulling down on the stick to create some stability, uh, that, that's also going to be considered uh, not a compensation, not being able to do the movement uh, perfectly as a three. Uh, we want to make sure that that stance leg also stays still. That's a common uh, thing that we're not looking at. We get so concerned about the moving leg that we're not paying attention to the stance leg. That's got to stay toe straight ahead touching the kit. All right, and then we'll just quickly go through some of the scoring. To get a three, the hips, knees, and ankles remain aligned in the sagittal plane. They need to have minimal to no mo movement 
uh, noted in the lumbar spine. And again, the dowel and hurdle remain parallel. That also includes bending the stick. That's no good as well. Uh, if they to get a two on this test, they would they would have to have alignment being lost with their hips, knees, and ankles. That's usually going to show up at the foot. Uh, movement is going to be noted in the lumbar spine, and the dowel and the hurdle do not remain parallel. So they don't need to have all of those mistakes, just one of those mistakes to get a two on this test. Uh, to get a one, that would be contact between the foot and the hurdle, or if, as mentioned before, they go outside of the the uh, the two sticks. Uh, and loss of balance noted, so that's on the way over, or even when they go ahead and try to return that foot back to the original starting position, uh, they may lose their balance, and that would be considered a one. Uh, if pain is associated with any portion of the test, it is a zero, and a medical professional should be uh, consulted to do a thorough evaluation of the painful area. Uh, this has been the second installment of the basics of the FMS, those FMS fundamentals on the hurdle step. Uh, next time, we'll discuss the inline lunge. For more information on functional movement systems, please visit functionalmovement.com. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach, and today I have Pat Davidson on, and Pat is the Director of Training Methodology and Continuing Education at Peak Performance. He's a former assistant professor at Brooklyn College as well as Springfield College. He was also the head coach at the, for the uh, Springfield College Team Iron Sports, and uh, he's a strongman competitor himself, two-time qualifier for the world champions at the Arnold Classic. And I, the reason why, I, you know, kind of interests me to have Pat on is because he's uh, kind of like reminds me a little bit like a Charlie Weingroff, uh, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road, not only talking about uh, the science, but really uh, somebody who, who really is in the trenches. So, Pat, thanks for coming on today. Well, Anthony, uh, I got to tell you, this is really an honor for me. I um I am a huge fan of the Strength Coach podcast. I think that um I, I have to catch up, but I definitely yeah. spent an entire summer a few years ago listening to every single one from zero to one fifteen. And uh I know that there's been a bunch since then, but I gotta tell you, I think it's the best resource going. And um it's something that really helped me to be a better teacher when I was working in a university setting. And to point me in the right direction for resources to be a better coach and strength athlete for everybody that I that I worked with, um, you know, I, I think you guys are are absolutely top notch, and that um, I, I think it's it for me, it's just a tremendous honor to be able to to be one of these incredible guests that you've had on in the past and going forward. So I really want to thank you for this opportunity. Great, great. I'm excited to have you on because I think, you know, even just looking at your resume, especially now at, you know, at peak, and we're going to get to that later, it's a, it's such a diverse uh, uh, resume here. And I, I, so I think, uh, and I've heard so many good things about you, probably from some former students, people like Ana Taco and Brendan Rierick and, and Sam Leahy and, and some other people there. So, uh, um, so yeah, we're looking forward to it. Now, I heard you talking on Mike Robertson. Um, yep. and one of, you know, so I'll probably base some questions off of that. And, and one of the things, and, you know, let's start with the foundation, you know, you, you kind of, I felt like, you know, the, the general preparation phase GPP, uh, you were really talking about emphasizing this phase. And I, I, from what I got, it, it felt like you didn't really think that we're doing this right or putting enough emphasis on their phase. So expand on that. Sure. And, um, you know, well, I think one of the problems with, with GPP is our, inability to understand, and this almost sounds contradictory, but the specificity inside of GPP, because, you know, I feel like people would think like, well, just like a CrossFit wad would be GPP. And I don't think that's what anybody's trying to say. And, um, you know, when, when I think of general physical preparedness, I typically go more in the realm of like the Charlie Francis style of coaching and program design where, um, you know, it's really interesting. I think I've read pretty much everything he ever put out and, you know, his program was a multi-year development of world-class sprinters. And really when you look at it, I think from like years zero through three, it was almost completely directed towards just general fitness development. And, um, you know, he oftentimes talked about like, there is no such thing as high intensity or low intensity for beginner level athletes it's all kind of high intensity for them. 
like they don't have the fitness level as a prerequisite to really be able to distinguish because they don't have the force production. They don't have the, the absolute engine size to be able to shift in and out of gears. Like, uh, a, you know, a 135 pound squat is, is not, it's, it's not enough of a stimulus to really warrant like tremendous recovery versus like someone that's able to squat 600 pounds. That's enough of a CNS stimulus to actually require CNS recovery. Like one, if you're, if you're a, a fairly novice level individual who doesn't have this tremendous level of strength and power, you're not really able to tax your CNS. You don't even have it in you. Like we're, we're doing all of this advanced kind of recovery and programming for individuals who haven't earned the right to receive that yet. Like you, you essentially have to just do a lot of stuff and build a big base of fitness through primarily oxidative means is, is what's talked about with beginner level athletes. Um, I, I think that it's just simply a case of like, we have to be more specific in talking about the oxidative training so that we accurately do these things, especially for, for our, our young people and, and, and people that are just getting into training. So I, I think that, you know, the, the, the reference that everybody should be pretty familiar with at this point is, is Joel Jameson's work on this stuff. Um, but you know, I, 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 I want to stop before I get going too much so that maybe we can, you know, if I'm going in the right direction for you, or at least we can kind of corral me before I get going in 15 directions all at once. Um, but I would, I would just like to say like, as a base premise, we have to be able to distinguish between what kind of level athlete we're dealing with in an appreciation of the fact that many of our, our younger athletes or, or less trained athletes, they literally don't have the, the, the strength and power to actually do CNS high intensive work. So literally everything is, is not really hitting that side of the spectrum. That, that's really interesting. I'm going to jump ahead because uh, to a question that I was going to ask you about volume. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I know you were talking in the podcast, in Mike's podcast, about, you know, you really like to push the physiology. But I think, and I, because I was going to ask you, are we not doing enough volume because we're so worried about recovery or overtraining? And that seems to be the case where for a lot of these. Um, um, newer lifters or people that don't have that capacity, we don't even need to, it sounds like we don't even need to worry about that as much. You really don't. Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I think that we have to be very careful of like which population we're talking about. You know what I mean? Because if I'm training young kids who are athletes, like I'm not going to necessarily push the resistance training envelope on them that much. Like I'm going to do a ton of like calisthenic work and med ball work and, and running and tempo runs and, and you know, speed work and special endurance work and things of that nature. I'm not going to, I'm going to attack them more from a central nervous system perspective and a, a cardiovascular perspective, like these two big, holistic systems that encompass the entire body. I'm not going to be particularly heavy in the way that I attack them from a tissue development standpoint. I'm not going to necessarily seek a lot of hypertrophy and I'm not going to be looking at a local environment of driving tissue physiology. I'm going to be looking at pushing centralized physiology from two of my bigger, more systemic uh, pieces with, with the you know, I'm going to do a lot of things that, that would be like body weight power, jumping and throwing things to develop the nervous system, reactive games, uh, tag, you know, even gymnastic activities, dropping them off of things so that they have to land and change directions. Um, I'm going to develop their oxidative system uh, as best I can through a multitude of movements and variability. Um, but I'm not going to push their tissues from a resistance training standpoint that much. I want them to learn skills and movement and get in a ton of volume in that regard. 
Now, if I'm talking about people that are, are, are a little bit older, you know, once you get to the point where you're in your late teens, uh, and you're looking to really do resistance training and it's time to develop tissues, um, I'm for sure going to hit you with a lot of volume and I'm going to challenge your capacity to handle volume, um, from a, a lot of, of sets and reps. Well, I, I guess you run into the problem too, probably, you know, you work with college athletes, at, at, you know, a couple of years ago. And, and, and the mm-hmm. thing is, is that you're probably still getting a lot of these elite college athletes, guys who are really good in their sport, guys and gals that are really good in their sport, but don't have that training age or haven't even really had the proper training. So where, where are you starting with them? Well, that's a, that's really a great question because for sure we had, um, we had some, some, some guys coming in that had almost no athletic background. Uh, uh, and, and, and you know what, like basically what we actually did, I could tell you all the theory and practice, like, but what we actually did was, you know, we had a bunch of very high level competitors and strong men and, and, um, every start of the year, would be, you know, we're, we're talking the beginning of September, we had the national championships in October. So the new guys kind of got ignored in some ways. They just had to, like, we're, we're, we're showing up for practice. The veterans have to train. I have to train. Like, we're all getting ready for national championships in the beginning of October. And you guys, here's the program. There's nobody really there to coach you. Um, but what, what's kind of interesting is, is it seemed to work pretty well. And I think I know why it worked now, because um, in, in large part, having to work with the general population at peak now, because um, I think that we can overcoach people in the beginning. And literally people that aren't used to training, the environment is so different for them. You know, they're entering this new world with all these weird pieces of equipment, barbells, dumbbells. Uh, you know, the room itself can be intimidating. They literally just need to learn the routine and the rhythm of it in some ways. You know, uh, like, hey, this is what we're doing today. We're going to squat and press and uh, because it's Monday. And, you know, the first time they do it, I could have coached them until I was blue in the face. They were still look terrible you know they're learning it uh and in many ways if i tried to code too much i would probably be over inundating them with sensory information like there's only so much that they can take and you know, some of these guys were able to work at their own pace and with other guys that are about the same level it's interesting from kind of an experimental standpoint to think back at it but you know it was we kind of told them like straight up like don't bother us like we're on a mission most of us are dieting and cranky and we're training a lot. We're sore. We're beat up. Like, do not bother us now. We'll actually coach you once we get to mid October. But for now, watch, do the best you can. Don't kill yourself and get into the flow of it on your own. And, um, you know, work because some of the guys that started in that environment are now guys that are really high level competitors, uh, three years later. Interesting. And I, I would wonder now for you, um, and, and I know, you know, the, the, the answer, it depends always, you know, it always can, it can come up for any question, but what, yeah, does an, I, <laughs> what does an ideal GPP look like? Because, you know, I mean, I know you, you're a systems guy. You like to have the systems because, and, and, you know, when you're dealing with general yep. population uh, as well, you're going to get probably you get a lot of variables, but you know you're almost getting the same type of person who doesn't have that that background of of lifting that training age. So what, what like even with just for like the average college athlete or high school athlete, because we have a lot of strength coaches listening. What does for you? What does the ideal you know GPP phase look like? And what are we okay. trying to accomplish great, in that? Great, great question. I think above and beyond everything else. Um, you know, the one cue that seems to work better for most people than any others is be an athlete. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, when somebody looks terrible during lift, usually I tell them like, Hey, be an athlete. And, and that seems to register for some people. They almost mirror, I think what they think of as what someone who's athletic looks like. So I, I just keep that in mind, like be an athlete 
And to me, be an athlete means you, you got to run, you got to throw, you got to jump, you got to lift and you got to change directions. And if you're not doing something from those zones, you're, you're missing out on a big piece of what it means to be an athlete in training. Like those are just the hallmarks. And, um, so I've, I've always got to have something from each of those, um, sectors present in what I'm doing at all times. Um, and if I'm missing one of those things, well, now I'm, I'm kind of going backwards in an area associated with being an athlete. But I, I would say this, like when it comes to being smart about GPP, you have to keep the underlying premise of the point of training always in mind. And the purpose of training is to create specific structural and functional adaptations. Okay. And what we're talking about here are tissues and, and systems. So I'm going to pretend like we're talking about adults or, or semi-adults, college-aged, uh, late high school, physically adapted individuals that, that don't have growing systems. They've reached their height that they're going to reach. So when I'm thinking GPP, I'm thinking that I need to do something for fast twitch fibers and I need to do something for slow twitch fibers to increase their work capacity. All right. And when I'm looking at fast twitch fibers, well, I, either fiber, okay, the th like we're based on this Henneman size principle as far as recruitment goes. Um, and, and, and well, I'll take even one further step back. We have something that is a law of physiology, and it is uh, Starling's law of fiber adaption, which says that a fiber, in order to adapt, must be both recruited and fatigued. I need to recruit the fiber. I need to fatigue the fiber if I'm going to make the fiber change. Um, and what we know is that force is the, is the variable that determines what fiber I'm able to recruit. The lower the force, the greater the slow twitch involvement. As force rises, fast twitch recruitment rises. So if I'm going to be targeting fast twitch fibers – uh, for their work capacity, I need to do things that are of high force. If I'm going to be recruiting and targeting slow twitch fibers, I need to do things of low force. Now, if I'm targeting fast twitch fibers, I need to do high force things, but I have an advantage because they have low resistance to fatigue. So as long as I can turn them on, I'll probably fatigue them pretty quickly. The hard part about slow twitch fibers is that while they're easy to recruit, they're hard to fatigue. So I need to do things that will keep them working for sustained periods of time so that I can actually fatigue them. Now, this is really where the beauty of Joel Jameson's work comes into play because he does have methods that we can use to get at these things. Um, uh, like high-intensity continuous training, for example, is a method that I can use to be able to cause adaptations in fast twitch fibers that would lead them to have greater work capacity. Um, you know, to summarize, in case anyone's not familiar with high intensity continuous training, an example of that could be single leg step ups with a heavy weight vest that you're wearing, and you could do step ups for 20 minutes. You might intersperse each step up with five to seven seconds of rest. Um, Every step up that you do is forceful. You're trying to create the greatest amount of force. You're just doing it at a cadence that will not bring your heart rate above a lactate threshold. So I never go into really a glycolytic zone. I'm staying with phosphogenic oriented work for every rep and an aerobic strategy for dealing with, um, re you know, recuperating and being able to continuously power my organism to work. So I, I need to do something. If I'm working with beginners and I'm building GPP, I need to target the work capacity of the fast twitch, and I need to target the work capacity of the slow twitch. The um, slow twitch, a, a great method for that would be the statodynamic method, where we're going to be doing relatively light weights, and we're going to be working with a slow tempo, uh, something along the lines of four down, four up, um, so that I never increase force to the point where I'm recruiting fast twitch fibers. I'm living in the slow twitch fiber zone. 
I just need to keep them under tension for extended periods of time. So I might go 40 to 60 seconds of work with a four down, four up tempo. And I might rest in between sets for the same amount of time. So I need to really bombard them with time under tension to try to fatigue them. And, um, you know, I think that, that that's an example of being smart and making your GPP more meaningful so that it actually targets specific fibers rather than just being kind of a CrossFit workout, which will just bombard you with everything but not really target anything. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, how do you know when we're ready <laughs> – when we're, when it's time to be out of GPP, like what is your, what are you, like, what are you, what, where's the marker there? Well, you could go with what Joel's recommending with uh, a resting heart rate, um, as, as kind of a guide. And, you know, he usually says 60 beats per minute and, uh, you know, he's probably the, the best resource to go to on all matters, uh, GPP. But, um, you know, I, I think that each sport probably has its own zone that you need to be at. And certainly, um, you know, a sport like baseball with great rest interspersed with very short, brief bouts of extreme power and explosion are probably very different from like soccer, where it's much more continuous. So um, and it's probably individual inside of all of those things. You know, I think the best bet that we could say would be if you do have a readiness device that's actually capable of tracking the internal physiology it would be when like an Omega wave device demonstrated that you were, you know, in a trend showing that the, you're, you're capable of, of handling the work capacity that's being dumped on you pretty successfully. Um, and you're going in the right direction. Uh, I, I, that's, it's probably, it's, it's not an, it depends answer because it's, it's physiology. You know what I mean? Like, w- like we're trying to manage an act allostatic load that we're imposing on an organism um, so that we can maintain homeostasis within very tight biological windows. And if the person is able to maintain homeostasis with a minimal allostatic load and still make observable progress in their output in terms of strength, speed, uh, VO2, then we're doing things right and I'm going to ke- continue to go along that road until the wheels fall off this wagon. And then I'll switch directions and put that person into more of a specific protocol. But as long as performance is going the right way and as long as I'm able to, dis- to see a physiological um, marker demonstrating that I'm training the right um, systems so that I'm not overwhelming the organism with excessive stress – that will lead to potentially problems, um, I'm pretty happy. Okay, good stuff. Um, And in terms of program design, I know you were talking about, you know, you've probably really narrowed down exercise selection over the years. You know, you've really kind of uh, thrown out a lot of stuff. Um, You know, and, and, you know, you definitely like to keep it simple. Uh, You know, a lot of coaches, as, as, as we, we kind of progress in this, in the field, we, we understand how important it is to keep it simple. But, um, how long can you, can you really do that with like a a certain amount of exercises and, and, you know, where does movement variability fit into this? And especially now that you're, you, you, you've entered the general population, uh, field training them, uh, you know, where does that fit in as well? So I, I think that what we have from like kind of a mathematical perspective or a big picture perspective is that uh, the lower the intensity, the greater the volume. You know, that's kind of classical. But I think that as intensity decreases, movement variability should increase. I think that, that variability and volume are, are things that should play, you know, hand in hand in the opposing direction of intensity. So, um, you know, when I am trying to dump the greatest amount of volume on someone, I'm going to try to have the greatest amount of exercise selection at the same point, at the same time, you know, um, there's a million different schools of thought or, or 
I shouldn't say that. Like when when we look at like uh, chronic pain syndromes and overuse injury kinds of things, I think like no matter whether you're kind of on the structural Sarman side of things or the functional kind of uh, Yonda PRI sort of side of things, um, we can all agree that doing the same movements over and over again and holding the same postures for extended periods of time are associated with overuse injuries and chronic pain problems. So if I'm going to be doing a lot of volume, uh, I need to try to switch it up quite a bit. All right. Um, versus as intensity rises, I really need to lock in and develop mastery over that, which I'm doing. I, I need to ensure that it's of the highest quality as intensity rises, but I don't want to be doing a million different things as intensity rises. I'm trying to really get better at things and I need to ensure that I have fewer things to concentrate on as intensity rises. So in, in some ways I think of it as like uh, a child development too. like children need tremendous volume and almost no intensity. And they also need as much variability as possible. And they seem to naturally do this when left to their own devices and only with parental supervision and uh, adults intervening do we get situations where intensity rises and and that could for children intensity could be things like um scoreboards and referees and whistles and lights and um you know they they do fewer things they're more constrained so i i just kind of base it off of off of those factors like if you're going to do a ton of stuff make it as variable as possible if you're going to be going as hard as you can imagine don't do too many things. Okay, makes sense. Great, great stuff. Um, you were talking about a study in relation to body comp on uh, Mike's podcast for athletes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something that I really haven't heard a lot of people talk about. I hear people talk about getting athletes stronger, getting them more powerful, you know, if we have to lose weight or if we even have to maybe gain weight. But I haven't really heard a lot of uh, coaches concerned with body comp. Can you talk about that study and, and talk to us about whether or not we really need to be focused uh, with our athletes on body comp? Sure. Uh, well, I think that I think that we can all agree that Rusty Jones is sort of one of the, um, the, the pioneers in our field and one of the godfathers of strength and conditioning and has probably helped more um, aspiring strength coaches in the NFL than just about anybody imaginable. And, you know, Rusty's uh, another Springfield guy, and I, I've been able to have a conversation with him. And, and he was able to express to me just how important body composition was for him while he was with the Bears. And it was probably the most critical measurement that he had at his disposal. And there's certain points at which you're just too fat to be a defensive back. Um, and, you know, if you look at a lot of stuff, like some of the major differences between like, let's say division one college athletes and division three and pros versus D one is in the body fat world where, uh, the higher level athletes tend to be leaner, um, which, you know, it, it's like from the world of not news, uh, you know, leaner, more muscular athletes at the same body weight will probably be able to run faster and jump higher. They're just carrying less excess baggage around with them. I think from political correctness in some ways, we've been opposed to speaking to the importance of leanness, particularly when working with female athletes because you can run into uh, female athlete triad and other kind of uh, sensitive areas. But lean athletes um, tend to be more successful in the majority of American sports as opposed to fatter athletes at the same position. So – the study that I was involved with was where uh, a colleague of mine who was working in Virginia was doing an examination of uh, anthropometrics as well as performance markers on lacrosse players. And he sent me the data, and the thing that really jumped out at me was that anything involving the athlete having to move their own body around was directly related to their level of body fat percentage. So that would mean uh, if you were doing push-ups, the fatter you are, the worse you're going to do. If you're doing bench press, on the other hand, where it's not your own body weight that you're moving, 
your body fat percentage had very little to do with the outcomes. Um, you know, what, what really jumped out to me was actually the repeat 300 yard shuttle performance where, you know, on the first 300 yard shuttle, faster or fatter athletes did just fine. But as you had to do two, three, four, five, six repeats of 300 yard shuttles, the fatter the athlete was, the more they had decrements in performance on successive repetitions. So when you think about the majority of sports that we play, uh, football, lacrosse, soccer, basketball, hockey, you have to repeatedly move your frame around. And the more you can do that without incurring fatigue, the better you're going to be able to maintain performance as you move towards uh, the fourth quarter or third period or just as the event goes on and you have to do more repetitions of the sport movement where you have to move your body to successfully complete the sport movement, the leaner you are, the more you're going to be able to maintain performance. And, and really like strength and conditioning in, in a lot of ways is not for the first quarter. It is for the fourth quarter. If you're going to make a big impact, uh, not get people hurt and be able to have people maintain their performance as fatigue load increases. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I again, I don't really hear a lot of talk on that, so it was uh, interesting to hear uh, to hear that. Um, and I work with golfers, so, uh, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I give them a questionnaire they fill out before they ever get here and um, for their first session. And, and uh, I always say, like, you know, what are your, you know, what's your goal? What do you want to get out of the strength conditioning program? And then, you know, what do you want to get out of your, go- you know, how do you want me to help you improve your golf game? Not one of them ever says, what would you like to get out of a fitness program? Anything about weight. And then they come in here. You know, my, my mm. clientele is mostly older. <laughs> and they're like, a lot of them are 30 or 40 pounds overweight. Nobody says a word about it. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, what's well, the ahead. other piece, just to because th- you kind of reminded me of thinking about golfers in a sport where your movement quality is the driver of performance. And, um, you know, like – you are not going to be able to display your optimal levels of movement quality and, and joint positioning and joint range of motion. If you're heavy, you know, like, I don't know if like, as a, as an example, like, have you ever eaten like a really horrible meal, like pancakes for breakfast, tons of it, syrup, the whole deal. And you kind of get like swollen fingers and knees and toes and stuff like that from the insulin load you're you're yeah. going to decrease your ability to move through ranges of motion with precision the more swollen you are you're unable to effectively like decompress chambers like the abdominal contents as well as the cells of muscles if you're going to move well you have to be able to empty chambers and demonstrate uh, stiffness of the septums that divide chambers from each other that's a general physiological concept that, that governs all systems. Like a heart is only able to move well and empty out a ventricle effectively if the interventricular septum has high levels of stiffness and the chamber is able to go from complete emptiness to complete fullness. Uh, you know, skeletal movement is not that much different. You are not going to be particularly mobile right after a large meal because you can't effectively compress the chamber of the gut. Pat, I want to shift over to, speaking of shifting, um, a good segue. Uh, you wrote an article called Shifting In and Out of Patterns, a Discussion of Extension, Neutrality, and Performance. There was some play on that on the shrinkcoach.com forum. I'll read a little bit. And it reminds me of, like, because I have some questions, you know, as with my golfers as well. Every year during spring training, you hear about pitchers trying out new pitches and to add to their repertoire. These pitchers don't just decide to add a new pitch in the middle of the season because they know they have to practice it and work out the bugs before trying to mix it in during games that count. In the world of PRI practitioners, there is oftentimes discussion regarding whether it's a good idea to pull athletes out of their pattern because this might make them run sm- slower, throw it with less velocity, or maybe not be able to jump as high. My personal thought on this matter is that 
Perhaps these, this quantifiable drop-offs are the result of the athlete not having practice performing the skill from the new position that they are performing them from. Perhaps with more practice and acquisition of training volume in this new position, the athlete would be able to reach the same quantifiable expressions of the sport movement. Okay, there's that. The overall concept that, that this document is aimed at addressing is this idea that the extens- is ex- excuse me, extension is a part of sports and a strategy that many athletes may overutilize. These adaptations will make these extension-driven sports movements even more powerful. These ad- adaptations are very specific to the tissues used in extension position, and the adaptations will not present themselves to the muscles that would be utilized in a more flexed position. Therefore, the musculature that would be recruited and utilized in a more flexed position would essentially be untrained. Um, but, but if we're training somebody like a pitcher or a golfer, and this is a question that comes up a lot, isn't that okay? It, do we need to get them into those, you know, neutral, that neutrality? Well, I mean, that's the question that we don't have an exact answer to because this is such a conceptual uh, piece here that we're talking about. But I, I'll try to make it more concrete, Okay. Um, when we're talking about internal rotation of a humerus, we would like to have a subscapularis participate in that, that movement. Okay. Now, if, if, if you're like, and, and when we talk about bad internal rotation of a humerus that tends to lead to injuries and problems, we're usually talking about internal rotation of a humerus being driven by a pec and a lat and a deltoid. All right. Why am I using a pec and a lat and a deltoid to try to do this? Is it because I've gone and hypertrophied these muscles to a significant degree through resistance training. Yeah, probably. How did I manage to do that? Well, I probably went into extension positions and extension dominant exercises and recruited these muscles repeatedly and made them work harder. So it's like I have an optimal strategy that I'm inherently born with, and that would be to use a rotator cuff to help internally rotate a humerus. I can be a modern day American and come up with my own good ideas, such as let me get jacked for the beach and create big pecs and lats. And now these pecs and lats, because of their size, they can all of a sudden take on responsibilities of smaller muscles that maybe have been left unchecked. If I am in an extended position through a thorax, I am going to be using a pec and a lat to power internal rotation. If I continue to use a pec and a lat for that strategy, I am going to be imposing micro trauma on these very small structures over time. I will wear this thing down. I will have a a PICR, a a, a center of rotation, an instantaneous center of rotation from the Shirley Sarman language that will migrate away from a centrated position. I'm going to be doing things that will limit my longevity in some way, shape, or form. So um, is that bad? Well, it depends on what kind of time frame we're looking at it from. You can probably get away with it. You can probably do a lot of stuff. You will not be able to really use that subscap unless you can get back into a neutral position, which probably means you're going to have to find flexion through a thorax and a flexed position through a pelvis, you're probably going to need to create a zone of apposition so that you can actually go back and use a subscap. All right. But like what happens if I if I get a zone, I achieve flexion, I reposition myself, I test out and I'm a neutral athlete. Okay. I have the potential to use a subscap to power internal rotation of the humerus. Unfortunately, I haven't used this subscap in like a decade because I've been latted up and pecked up and that's been my strategy for a long time. Like I got to give this subscap a chance to actually catch up and become a subscap again. Like it's just like a baby subscap. It's undeveloped. It's done nothing. So I need to strength train it. I need to then be able to figure out how to integrate it back in. Now, I, I just think like, this is where the discussion probably has to go as opposed to just, you know, like the show is not getting neutral, neutral through repositioning through like, uh, you know, most of the people you work with, you give them a left hamstring, you make them neutral. Uh, now they have the ability to improve their test results. Um, 
which shows that you now have greater movement variability. That movement variability, you now have to power it through the right strategy of muscular recruitment. You have to power it through the right synchrony pattern. You've got to go ahead and do that through training, though. Like nobody's going to give it to you. You have to go out and earn it and work for it and acquire it. And, you know, everything is biomechanics ultimately. Like we do know that, that every sport has an associated optimal biomechanics with it. And as long as you're within the window of what's considered to be um, appropriate slash optimal, you're probably going to have a long playing career and you're probably going to be able to maximize your potential. Uh, you know, when you begin these compensatory patterns and beginning to have to rely on alternative joints as opposed to the appropriate joints to power your biomechanics, you will incur wear and tear. Um, you'll have a chemical environment that's going to be loading you up with cortisol and, uh, and you're going to be undoing yourself for the long haul. So I'm just trying to talk about like, what is the actual like synchrony I, I don't want dyssynchrony. I don't want asynchrony. I want proper timing. I want proper synchronization. I want the right joint to be moved by the right muscle at the right time to be able to create the right mechanics for biomechanics associated with sport, sport actions. Uh, whatever it is that you do and however it is that you do it, you will get better at that thing. But it doesn't mean it's optimal and it might have been a shortcut to get there. So – from the long haul perspective, there is, in fact, the right muscle and the right joint action associated with optimal. And the closer we can get to that, the earlier and keep that, the better. Yeah, it's an interesting, you know, again, working with golfers, I think for me, I've, I've seen, you know, you hit the nail on the head. You, you know, you have to earn that right there. You have to you have to train it. It's not no one's going to give it to you. So when when we get them more mobile, more stable, stronger, more powerful here in the gym, it doesn't always translate because they don't put the work in with the practice. And and I always tell them, I'm like, it takes these guys, the pros, who do this all day, every day with the team, it takes them six months to change a swing. And uh, and they're trying to you know do it in uh, in a, in a month or two here. So uh, interesting, right. Pat. I want to finish up though with um, just a quick question about you know about your your education. You know, again, you are the director of training, methodology, and continuing ed at Peak in New York City. Yep. And you you that's coming from a guy who was an assistant professor at Springfield in Brooklyn. You know, and it's got to be interesting for, you know, things have had a change in your mind about what you're teaching or what you want to get across to the trainers now, as opposed to these young exercise science students. Talk to me about yep. the direction that you're taking the education uh, with, with uh, you know, with your trainers at peak. Sure. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that I've always been a fairly uncompromising person. And, um, you know, I, I don't ever really look at things as being that much different. There's just a right way to do things or maybe, maybe not right, but like there's always, uh, more correct or more optimal. And there's, there's always like, I just look at things on a quality continuum. Like, uh, some things are higher quality than other things. And you generally know it when you see it, when it comes to quality and the more you can express high quality in all of the endeavors that you take part in, the more likely it is that success will be associated with that which surrounds you. And I just look at this as being no different. Like I, I'll, I'll always resort to trying to go with best practice and then it usually never works out that way and it kind of devolves into something lesser than. So it's like if you just start at the highest level – then you typically, I, I found two things I, like, and as a concrete example, like I remember my, my first week at Brooklyn college before classes started, you know, I was, I came from Springfield college graduating with a PhD and some of the other professors were like, Hey, uh, you know, the students here aren't of the same level as Springfield college kids. So don't expect them to be able to learn at the same level. And all I did at that point in time was I just upped the intensity of the information that I gave them. I did not compromise it. I, wrote, I raised the bar even higher, um, and they responded. I, I think that people tend to rise 
when you present them with higher level things. I, I never resort to downplaying things or dumbing things down ever for anyone. I inherently believe that people will become that which you present them to be. So uh, with this, it's like, you know, at, at peak, like our, the new peak is going to be ridiculous. Like we'll have things like the Omega wave and we'll have uh, sensory deprivation chambers and we'll have the best training equipment imaginable. And a lot of it is going to be applied to people that make up the general population, albeit people that might have more wealth from a financial perspective than the average general population. But they're certainly not athletes. And um, you could in many ways make the argument that like bringing an omega wave to a general population person and training them with high level biomechanics is kind of the equivalent of bringing a bazooka to a pillow fight. But that's that's kind of what I want to do. Um, I, I want to make sure that I go with best case scenario. And if people don't like it, we always have the other direction to go in, which is kind of reduced quality or reduced optimization for whatever their comfort zone is. But, you know, I expect clients and, and, and I've been able to have success with it for the most part, regular people come in and you can teach them things like how to control a pelvis and how to control a rib cage and how to jump and how to throw a med ball and how to lift weights and how to deadlift. Um, so it's like, I, I just, I think that, that in teaching trainers how to work with general population, we're going to stick with the, like with good, hard, high quality exercise science. And we're going to stick with like high level training modalities. Like we'll, we'll try to figure out best way to load the general population so that they get uh, high levels of force production in their life when they lift weights and good techniques so they don't hurt themselves. And we'll use good quality energy system development with them when the time comes and we'll train rate of force development. We'll train all these real qualities associated with human performance and physical output. And we'll do it with the best case modalities coming from the best minds in the field co taught with the best coaching. And I, I think that, that, um, you know, I'll, I'll just simply give everything of that, that I know to the other trainers working at peak so that we have the highest imaginable training force in terms of their understanding of human physiology, biomechanics, psychology, exercise technique, exercise cueing. Um, I, I would I would hope to treat these people as if they were multi million dollar professional athlete investments. Well, Pat, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you're going crazy over there right now, but uh, <laughs> wanted to get you on. There's been uh, you know uh, a lot of talk about about some of your uh, some of your work and and uh, been been trying to thinking about. I've been it, you've been in the back of my brain for a while, so it was great to have you come on and explain some of these things. So really appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on and. Um... You know, this is in many ways a bit of a, of a of a dream come true for me because of of the esteem that I hold your your podcast and your work in and, and everything that Coach Boyle has ever been involved with as well. So, um, you know, this is this is really a great moment for for me to feel um, a, a fairly high level of, of satisfaction in myself, and I want you to know that that as Thanksgiving's coming up, I feel very grateful that this opportunity was presented to me. All right, great stuff. Thanks again, Pat. You got it. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 176 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Pryor, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for their products and info on their educational seminars. Don't forget they got the big holiday sale going on right now. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Coach Pat Davidson for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Frank Dolan and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Joel Sanders for his insights into the art of coaching with Exos. Check them out at teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. Audible.com is giving Strength Coach Podcast listeners a special offer. To download your free audiobook today, go to freebookfromant.com. That's freebookfromant.com for your free audiobook. And of course, remember, you can join strengthworks.com and have access to the site for just $1 
three days, just a buck. Once your three-day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to co download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Arana. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.